Good morning, everybody. My name is Fred Mifflin. I'm the president of the Canadian Club of Toronto, and I'm pleased to be your host this morning. For 120 years, we've offered a leading venue for the free and open exchange of ideas that challenges conventional thinking. We're proud of this long-standing tradition and prouder still of your ongoing support. Through our programs and activities, we offer access to dynamic business, political, and public figures from around the world. Our guest speaker this morning, Jordan Banks, is a great example. So before we get started, I'd like to ask Jordan to draw a business card, and the lucky winner will receive a $250 airline voucher courtesy of Air Canada, the club's official airline sponsor, and Lynn Chow, the ex executive director of the club, will announce our winner. Our winner is Thomas Rado from Base Sourcing. Did I say that right? Congratulations. Congratulations. Before I formally introduce Jordan, here's a preview of some of our upcoming events. On Monday, November 7th, our Dream Girl panel will feature Kamal Minhas with Megan Grove from Future Waste Recycling, Susan MacArthur of Green Soil Investments, and Leslie Wu from Metrolinx on the topic of female entrepreneurship. And the following day, on Tuesday, November the 8th, Ontario's Finance Minister, the Honorable Charles Sousa, will be at our podium to update us on the state of Ontario's fiscal affairs and his government's plans to build Ontario through strategic investments. To order your tickets or to learn more about the club, please visit our website at canadianclub.org. You can also join the conversation via Twitter and Instagram by following us at CDNCLUBTO or by using the hashtag CCTBanks. Our sincere thanks to Facebook and Jordan for hosting us in this great space this morning. And for those of you who are interested in seeing more about the Facebook space, uh, tours are available after we conclude. And now our special guest. Canada has one of the most highly engaged Facebook users anywhere in the world. Canadians love Facebook. It has forever changed the way we connect with family, friends, and in fact, clients. While Instagram has redefined the way we see ourselves in the world, literally. Heading up the Canadian operations of Facebook and Instagram is a highly respected and award-winning business leader, entrepreneur, and community leader, Jordan Banks, Managing Director of Facebook and Instagram in Canada. A lawyer by training, and I promised I wouldn't hold that against you, Jordan is a widely respected as an innovator and entrepreneurial champion. Prior to Facebook, he served as CEO of Jump TV. Before that, he helped launch eBay in Canada and was instrumental in the success of its Canadian operations. He's been recognized as the one, one of the most influential people in Canada by the Financial Post magazine, and Canadian Business Magazine named him as one of the 50 most powerful business leaders in the country. Despite his challenging schedule, he finds time to serve on the boards of some of Canada's best-loved organizations, including Baycrest, Sick Kids Hospital Foundation, Dementia Hack, and Free the Children, to name a few. We're also pleased to have John Ehrlichman, anchor of BNN and CTV National News, moderating this morning's conversation with Jordan. I also want to invite you to join the discussion by filling out the Q&A cards, and our staff and volunteers will collect them during the program. So now, gentlemen, welcome. Canadian Club of Toronto's stage is yours. Thanks, Fred. Thank you. Much appreciated. Yeah, yeah, nice guy. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Fred, and uh, hopefully everybody got something to eat. If you didn't, the good thing is, since there are some tours I heard, Jordan, they have snacks at Facebook. You can sort of subtly, there's chips in them, you just sort of, how do people take a whole bag of chips? Early morning Doritos. 
<laughs> breakfast of champions. So anyone who looked at the agenda for today probably saw the word disruption. We use that word a lot. I end up use it a lo uh, using it a lot in our, our reporting these days. When, when it comes to that word and how you think of it um, in the context of the changing world around us, in the context of Facebook, what, what comes to mind for you? I think the first thing that comes to mind is uh, a meeting that I was in a few weeks back with the folks at Singularity University. Um, and Singularity, for those of you that don't know, is this concept that at one point in time uh, in the near future, uh, the ability for computers to think like and better than a human brain will cross and singularity will happen. It's, it, it's a philosophy that was originated by a guy named Ray Kurzweil. And uh, I was talking to him about a bunch of things, and, and one of the gentlemen said to me, you know, as it relates to the pace of change, today is the slowest day for the rest of your life. Right, today is the slowest day for the rest of your life. So when I think about disruption, uh, the first thing I think about is the, the incredible speed and pace of change. Uh, and then the th second thing I think about is just how fundamentally everything is changing. You know, there's not one industry, not one geography, not one population that isn't being fundamentally disrupted in everything they do um, in every single way. And so when we think about Facebook and, and our ability to not only uh, help with disruption, but in some cases force that disruption, um, it is core and, and cornerstone to just about every meeting we're in, every product we develop, uh, and every business we work with. The idea of this being the slowest day for the rest of your life is exciting. For some, it's probably terrifying. If I think back to um, someone like Clay Christensen of Harvard, who talked about, got us on this, this train towards dis discussing disruption when he talked about disruptive innovation, he wasn't necessarily talking about the idea of one groundbreaking change. It was more about in the case of a product, something that all of a sudden is ac accessible to so many people, almost disrupting, arguably, a company's own business model. And we, it's, you know, we're not just seeing this with a Facebook. We see it with an Uber or an Airbnb or an Amazon. Yeah. So how, and obviously you work with a company that embraces this change, but as a society, how should we be thinking about all these changes as quickly as they are coming? Yeah, I, I think it is. Uh, it's not easy for anybody, and uh, it's not easy for us. Uh, and this is what we do for a living. And so I think there's some pretty base principles that people need to think about, especially businesses need to think about as it relates to disruption and change. Um, you know, the, the first is we have built organizations, uh, skill sets, and talent pools for the most part that aren't ready for it. And so um, the companies that are succeeding today, almost unequivocally, are the companies that'll, that are built for and optimized for speed. There are a lot of legacy uh, organizational structures and go-to-market frameworks that just aren't optimized for speed. And when things change so quickly and the opportunity is so immense and the competition is so fierce, if you're not optimized for speed, uh, you're in trouble. I think the second thing that, that, that businesses need to think about is who's doing whatever it is that they do. Right? What's the talent look like? How are they attracting and retaining the best talent and ensuring that that talent is empowered um, and given the opportunity to do what they do best each and every day without unnecessary bureaucracy and without unnecessary levels? Um, so this idea of being open and transparent, for example, in a society that is changing so quickly is, is paramount. Access to information is a currency now. And so he or she that has the most and most unfettered access to information generally will do better. So as people think about how information flows throughout nonprofits or governmental organizations or companies, one of the things we work with a lot of companies on is how do you create organizational structures and processes to allow information to flow quickly uh, and unfettered so that you can empower people wherever they are uh, in whatever situation. Well, I, I do want to talk in a little bit more about how businesses are using Facebook and, uh, and also your take on, on culture. but. Since you did play hockey growing up, I feel like there is kind of this 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 Gretzky going to where the puck is. It, it does sound easier uh, yeah. on paper, though, than to actually even structure a business towards where we might be going versus what's right in front of you. Yep, uh, and I, I think that's right. Uh, one of the things, and, and one of the things we do, and I think we do it well, is um, th there's a necessity out there for legacy companies, and when I say legacy companies. Generally, what I'm talking about are companies that, that haven't um, been born over the course of the last decade. So if your company is 13 years old, 
for the purpose of this comment, you're a legacy company. You need to partner with companies that are uh, relatively new digital companies who can not only give you a sense of things to do, but also allow you, provide some oil to lubricate your business to learn and to innovate uh, and to experiment and to test. It's really hard if you're, if you're a legacy business to do that without the help, without the partnership, without the guidance and support of a quote unquote new digital business. Um, and so one of the things that we started this office doing was we talked to a lot of companies just about solutions, marketing solutions, how to sell more stuff, how to generate more demand. And now if you're a fly on the wall in a discussion or a meeting I'm in with any CEO in the country, uh, that might occupy 15% of the meeting time. So begs the question, well, what else are you talking about if you're not talking about that? Well, we're talking about how to attract and retain great talent. We're talking about how to build organizations for the future. We're talking about how to go where the puck is going to be and not where it is. We're talking about what innovation means, how do you measure it. We're talking about building a test and learn environment so that people in organizations feel that I'm not going to be right all the time, but that's OK. Yeah. Right? I have the ability not to be right all the time, and I take all those mistakes I make, uh, and I make sure those learnings are scaled quickly and efficiently throughout the organization so, so, so nobody else is making those same mistakes. Um, and that is, how, and that is how legacy businesses have a chance of surviving and winning in the 21st century. That kind of opens the door for, for, for my own anecdote because Facebook's a company that I've covered extensively and I used to be based in Silicon Valley and I was there on the day when the company went public and boy was there a lot of pressure for this company. It had just acquired Instagram yeah. and a lot of people wanted to know how this business, which had really grown up on the desktop and was going through its own evolution, everyone's saying, how are you going to make the transition to mobile, to mobile, to mobile? Yeah. And um, what maybe Wall Street and Bay Street didn't see at the time was what was happening inside Facebook under a guy, Mark Zuckerberg, obviously, who is sort of looking to where the puck is going to be, yeah. who in some cases, people would tell me, literally taking computers off desks so that the team that was charged with figuring out how to solve the, the issue of how are people going to use our own product on the phone are working and living on their phones all day as opposed to being in that traditional yeah. corporate structure sitting at a desk on a computer trying to solve that same issue. Yeah, uh, so you know, for those of you that, that don't remember, May of 2012, we went public. And a lot of people would characterize the lead up to our IPO as being one of the most anticipated and one of the most hyped IPOs in the history of IPOs. And so there was a ton of expectation around that day. And then what would happen subsequent to the IPO? What would happen to the stock and what would happen to our business? Um, and what we learned pretty quickly leading up to the IPO and the few months after the IPO was there was an unbelievable amount of focus, rightfully so, uh, on how we were thinking about mobile. And at the time, frankly, we had a big fat 0% of our revenue generated off of mobile device. Um, we had a really crappy app that was developed sort of in HTML, which was the wrong way to develop apps back then. Um, and we didn't really have a clear mobile strategy when folks on the street were asking, how are you thinking about this revolution? And so one of the things we had to do in pretty short order, otherwise literally risk the future of the company, was do a full 180 and reorient the company solely around mobile. And at the time, I remember you know, Mark Zuckerberg standing up in front of the company and explaining what had transpired um, with our IPO and, and really imploring people not to focus on what the markets were talking about, but to focus on what our consumers and what our business partners wanted. Um, and in, in furtherance of our mission of making the world more open and connected. And that was all only going to happen if we had a mobile first strategy. And so Mark retrained every single engineer. He didn't do it personally, but we, tr we trained at his behest every single engineer to be a mobile first engineer. Uh, you could not step into a meeting and talk about desktop solutions or products. You literally would be asked to leave, and he did that with some of our most prominent engineers following the IPO. Um, and, and in pretty short order, the meme around Facebook internally was that if you're not focused on something that is mobile related, uh, you're not focused on the right thing. And as I look back, those six months from May of 2012 to the end of that calendar year were the most pivotal months of the company. Um, if we wouldn't have done that and literally rung the alarm bells and made sure that each and every person was on the same mobile track, I would question whether or not we'd still be in existence today. Hmm. That's a fascinating story. Uh, you don't always hear those stories, certainly in large companies. Mm -hmm. um, for, for a lot of obvious reasons. Culture is one of them. So maybe we can talk a little bit more about culture and its role in disruption. Because earlier you, you made the point of saying a lot of times you're, you're speaking with executives 
about talent, getting the right talent. I mean, yeah. here we are at Mars. This is sort of a center of innovation in Toronto, and you have a lot of young, ambitious, um, potential future business leaders who do want to be developing their own apps. They don't necessarily want to go into large Canadian companies or American companies or go work on Bay Street or in a law firm in the traditional sense that they did. Yeah. So getting access to the talent is an issue and also getting everybody on the right page is so important. So what do you think about just on a day-to-day -day basis on this, on this issue of culture? Yeah. So Peter Drucker, who many of you I think have heard of or, or have read, who's a great uh, was a great business consultant, has a line that, like if I got a tattoo, it would probably be the tattoo I'd put on my forehead, which is, culture eats strategy for breakfast every day. Right? Culture eats strategy for breakfast every day. Um, and I think every day, that becomes more and more true and important. And so when I think about how do you attract and retain great talent, how do you build an organization that's well poised to succeed in today's realities? Uh, it is all about a few things that sound really simple but are really, really hard. Um, the first is this idea of being open and transparent. And I think gone are the days where offices and businesses can have these walled and siloed gardens where you know, you're in accounting and the only information that you need access to are, are ledgers. And you know, you're in marketing and the only information you need access to um, relates to consumer behavior. What you want to do to attract the best and the brightest is you want to ensure that you empower them to be the absolute best at what they can do. And it's all about access to information, right? He or she, again, who has access to the most in, in information in the quickest amounts of time wins. And so in this environment, being open and transparent is core to everything we do. It's manifest in our office space, it's manifest in the way we work, manifest in the way uh, people can access information that has nothing to do with their day-to-day -day jobs. So that is critical. We interview brilliant young people from University of Waterloo, top engineers, the first thing they want to know is how empowered am I going to be to have an impact. Second thing, and, and this, if I was to stack and rank order them, this might be the most important. Um, great people want to work for great companies that have important missions. And so our mission is to make the world more open and connected, full stop. And what we say to every single person of the 14,000 plus people that work at Facebook is if you're not working on something that is making the world more open and connected, you're working on the wrong thing. And it is the absolute common theme that runs through how we think about our partnerships commercially, how we think about connecting the unconnected world, how we think about buying companies like Instagram and WhatsApp that, that whose core mission is to connect people. Um, it, is, it is the guiding light to everything we do, and so nobody ever gets lost. You, know, you talk about keeping people on the, same, on the same path. It's hard to get lost when you have a mission that is that simple and that compelling, and a leader um, who is so maniacally focused on it, and who from day one has said, if we're not doing that, we're not doing our jobs. And even just something around your office, I mean, people who go on a tour later are going to see that your conference rooms, your meeting rooms have a Canadian-themed name. Mm -hmm. But that's something, I believe, that you had all employees be a part of deciding what those names would be. Yeah, I, I think you know, the democratization of almost everything, I think, is the reality of today. And, and, and office space and the way people interact and flow through office space should be no different. And so you, know, you referenced the fact that our meeting rooms are all named for Canadian appropriate icons or imagery or sayings. Uh, and it wasn't me that decided we were going to call something you know, Gord Downey Street. Uh, it was we voted on it. You know, people threw a bunch of names on a poll, and people voted on it. And the top 15 names became the names uh, of the meeting rooms. Uh, and little things like that, which you, know, you really do sort of chalk up to being almost little insignificant, are big, right? Little things in aggregate end up being one big thing. And the idea that this office doesn't belong to me as, as the person that runs the office, but belongs to, belongs to each and every person in this office who are empowered to create posters uh, of sayings and cultural imperatives that are important to them is a massive statement. Um, and it's really, really important as you think about scaling an organization. Let's, uh, let's wander down that road ahead when it comes to disruption, since you guys are preparing for it, and you talked about an open and connected world. We know that Facebook is using drones and satellites to actually make that a reality. I guess my question, maybe you can give people some context on that, and then also, again, as a big public company, you have quarterly results, uh, expectations, um, um, sort of the balancing act between uh, addressing that and also being able to go out and, and have projects that are ultimately going to benefit Facebook, but it's kind of a longer term uh, focus area. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the 
one of the great things about working for Mark is that Mark doesn't think really in weeks or months or quarters or years. He thinks in dec decades and a century. Uh, and so for those of you that saw a few months ago, you know, Mark comes out and says, um, his, himself and his wife Priscilla will donate up to $3 billion to uh, cure, manage, and prevent every disease known to humankind in the lifetime of his daughter, Max. Think about that. Every disease, cure, manage, prevent in the lifetime of his daughter. That's not a quarterly, yearly, decade thing. That's a long-term vision, and that's a way to fundamentally make the world a better place. And so when you think about um, you know, what it is we do in our mission, the mission isn't to make the world more open and connected where it's easy, or open and, open and connected where data runs freely, or open and connected where people have enough money to buy a device and get a data plan. It is to make the world more open and connected full stop. And so in a world of seven plus billion people right now, we have four billion people that are unconnected, that do not have access to the internet. And I think everybody at Facebook and beyond believes that is a core important human right these days, right? It gives people voice and it gives people opportunity. And so we have a whole division that is focused on nothing but getting those four billion people connected in some way or another. Um, and we do um, very interesting partnerships with local governments, local telcos, um, OEMs, carriers, to figure out a way to make it accessible and affordable so that people that have not been connected for any reason now have the ability to be connected. And when I joined Facebook almost seven years ago, if you would have told me that we had a whole other section of the business that was employing like aeronautical engineers, I would have scratched my head and said like, well, what are they gonna do, right? What is an aeronautical engineer gonna do at Facebook? And now we have hundreds of aeronautical engineers working on things like, you know, we have something called Aquila. And Aquila is an unmanned spacecraft that has a wingspan of a 737. Um, it is, weighs less than a small car and is powered um, with the equivalent amount of power that would take three hair dryers to work. It could be up in the air 60 to 90,000 feet for 90 days, and it can beam connectivity down to land to the precision of a quarter. So we thought of it, we built it, and now we've tested it. Um, and does that cost a lot of money? And yes, does it inure to next quarter's earnings? Absolutely not, but it is so important to our mission that Mark is willing to make the trade-off. If you haven't read, you want to read something really interesting. Mark wrote, it, wrote an awesome letter um, it was part of our S1 in advance of, of going public. And it talked a little bit um, about how we thought about companies, how we thought about public companies, and how we thought about the obligation com public companies have to their shareholders. Um, and, and one of the lines in that is so apropos of your question. One of the lines was, and let me see if I can get it right, um, Facebook is a company um, that doesn't build products to make money. Facebook is a company that will make money in order to build products so the world can become more open and connected. And on this journey, by the way, when you do stuff like Aquila, it makes for pretty cool video to look at as well. A lot of cool video. Um, so I have a question here, and uh, uh, we are coming around to take some of these questions, which we'll, we'll, uh, we'll throw to Jordan near the end of this uh, session. So thank you for this one. Um, so that's a little bit on communications disruption. Yep. Um, on the subject of commercial disruption, you made a couple of references to businesses, we have businesses here, we have nonprofits here. I think a lot of people um, still trying to figure out their best path forward if they're using Facebook. Mm -hmm. I know that you've spent a lot of time um, sort of thinking about Canadian-based businesses or nonprofits and how they are expanding their reach globally using Facebook. Maybe you could shed a little light on that. Sure. Um, Yeah, I mean, so let me start here by saying whether you're a small business, you own run restaurant in small town Ontario, or you're a multinational business that happens to be headquartered in Toronto, believe it or not, when you pull away all the noise and you look at what do they have in common, every business has three core elements in common. They're focused on acquiring a lot of new customers at a price that's efficient, call that cost of acquisition. They're focused on how do we max out lifetime value of that new customer. And in the middle, they're saying, how do we ensure there's enough money in the middle at scale that we can make enough money to be a viable business? Cost of acquisition, spread, and lifetime value. The first one is the biggest challenge for every business right now, especially in a country of only 35 million people. Effectively, how do I get enough demand in order to buy my supply or subscribe to my service so, that I, can, so I have a viable business? Um, and for a very long time, demand acquisition was hugely inefficient. 
It was word of mouth. I might put a poster up at a coffee store and hopefully somebody would see it and come into my shop. I might buy a radio ad. But there was no real affordable mass way of getting demand. Um, and there was definitely no way of getting that demand outside our borders. And so one of the things that Facebook has done and allowed small, mid, and large-sized businesses to do is just expand their demand pools. And so the most successful businesses in Canada on Facebook are businesses that really understand how to acquire demand. And to the extent it's appropriate for your business, how to acquire demand outside our borders. And so little things happen. Like there's a great business in Canada called um, AN Manufacturing and AN Commerce. AN Commerce didn't exist two years ago. Two brothers who were bankers who decided, you know what, we're going to use Facebook to access global demand for products that we will almost build on demand based on hot trends and, and, uh, and emerging cycles. And so what do they do? They know exactly in Canada the type of person that's willing to buy one of their products. They use our product to find people like that in other geographies. We tell them how many people are like that in other geographies. So I know that women 18 to 35, university educated, living in a major metropolitan center who like Madonna, right? They buy my product in Canada. Well, we're going to help you in 90 other countries figure out who those women are and get a message to them that is timely, relevant, and compelling. And so you have these businesses that are now being born and expanding by virtue of accessing um, all of this domestic and foreign demand. So that's, that's one thing that is critically important as you're a business thinking about using Facebook is it's a great demand acquisition vehicle. The second thing is you know, this device has changed everything. We talked a little bit about how it's changed our business, but there's not an industry, whether you're in the payments industry, transportation industry, hotel industry, nonprofit, whether you're, government, whether you're a government or somebody running for political office, right? It's the most personal device in the history of the world. In fact, if somebody, let me just get a sense of the audience. If your best friend called you and said, I got a really busy couple of days and my car broke down, can I borrow your car for the next two days? How many people would lend your best friend your car? Right? Show of hands. Almost everybody. If that same conversation happened and your best friend said, I need to borrow your phone for a few days, right? Like how many people would say, no problem, take my phone, see you on Monday? Like nobody? Right? And even to call this a phone is a joke because we don't even talk on this thing really anymore, right? This is a little mini computer that could send a person to the moon uh, and happens to be in our pocket. So this has changed everything. So if you're a small business, um, you're thinking to yourself, I need a mobile strategy. I'm like otherwise I'm done. And mobile strategies, like what are they and who do I hire and how do I think about this thing? And the reality is by virtue in this country of having 22 million people on Facebook, 19 million of whom uh, come in, are on a mobile device, by working with Facebook and being on Facebook de facto, you have a mobile strategy. So you take those two realities, right? Mobile strategy and the ability at scale to access demand very efficiently and effectively. And that's why the vast majority of businesses uh, in, in Canada are on Facebook. And, and by the way, the, the, the momentum we're experiencing as a company, sure you read about all of the large multinational businesses that are on Facebook doing big things and transforming their businesses. But the reality is small business is the driver. So we have 60 million businesses on Facebook who have pages, business pages, vast majority of them small business. In this country alone, 98% of all businesses are small businesses, and they represent 71% of all private sector jobs. And so our, the, the economic viability and sustainability and, and hopefully ultimately profitability of their businesses in this country rest in the hands of small businesses. And we have a bunch of stuff we do with small businesses. We've had 14 small business booth sessions around the country or where for free small businesses can come and learn more about Facebook and, and the tips and tricks and best practices of doing a good job. And there's an incredible amount of information, not only on our website, but other websites about how to do it well. Really, if we do our job well, and this is, this is really the motto, the commercial motto that we have in this office, if we are doing our job well, we are taking small businesses and we're making them large businesses, and we're taking local businesses and we're making them global businesses. I mean, the stats are amazing. There was a stat overnight which said that globally, internet usage on tablets and mobile devices for the first time in October exceeded desktop computers. It's pretty mind-blowing. Yeah, and that li those lines will never cross again. Two years ago, by the way, if you just looked at where people were spending their time, the, for the first time ever since the, the advent of TV, two different forms of media crossed. And so, you know, way back in the 50s, television surpassed radio for time spent. And in the latter part of 2013 in Canada, 
digital past TV and digital with mobile being a big co component for time spent. So again, those lines in our lifetime will, will never cross again. If I were to ask you a more broad question about innovation in Canada, because you look at the health of the Canadian economy right now, like a lot of major economies around the world, growth is not what many of us would like to see. Yep. And that's in part due to some of the changes in, that are taking place in society, period. They, they play a prominent role in everything right now, including election campaigns and the yep. one that's going to be taking place next week. Um, so there is obviously a huge push, whether it is through companies like Facebook, which are always hungry for great new talent that can help push the innovation curve, or government leaders. It's always is easier said than done. How would you sort of, where would you place Canada right now in terms of its ability to um, foster homegrown companies, create that sort of next um, generation of jobs and sort of the innovation and that disruption that sort of all seems to be important, paramount really, to growing economies like ours going yeah. forward? So with all respect to our media in Canada, um, our, our media loves to paint dire pictures about the state of our nation. And the reality in my world is that nothing could be further from the truth, right? Let me start with the premise that if you would have surveyed over the last 150 years Canadians and said, how appreciative and how fortunate do you feel to be living in this country? There's never been a time more today where more Canadians would say, I am so blessed to live in the greatest country in the world, not just because of the craziness that's happening down south, but if you look at what's happening in Asia and parts of Europe, I mean, it's crazy town, right? And we live in the greatest country in the world. And so I think we start from that premise. Then the question is, well, does the greatest country in the world have an innovative future? I think unquestionably our country has a very promising uh, innovative future. Um, I think we have some challenges, but let me get to those in a second. If you look at some of the businesses that we have in Canada right now, whether you look at Shopify, look at Hootsuite, Borowell, Wealthsimple, I mean, I could go on and on and on. These are world-class businesses that have chosen to not only launch in Canada, but stay in Canada, right? And ultimately, that's the proxy for how are we doing as a country around innovation. Do people stay here? And the reality is great businesses are being born. They're being funded by both Canadian and U.S. money, and they are choosing to stay here. Awesome. We have incredible entrepreneurs. 15 years ago, people would say, well, there's RIM. You know, and RIM has Jim and Mike, and they're very globally thinking, but there are no other globally thinking entrepreneurs in the country. They're very domestic and very parochial in the way they think about the world. Not the case these days. Show me a great Canadian business, and there are hundreds of them that are emerging, and they're all thinking about global markets. It doesn't mean we're not without our challenges. Um, and we have some pretty big challenges if we are going to be the best uh, and globally competitive over the course, course, course of the next decade. Talent is a real issue. Talent is a real issue. We have somewhere between good and very good talent, um, but going forward, if we don't have great talent and huge pools of great talent, that is going to be a major, major obstacle for us. And so we need to rethink the way not only we retain our brilliant young kids in Canada, but how we think about attracting brilliant kids from around the world and making Canada the place they want to come and build their careers. That's the first thing. Second thing we've got to figure out is we can't be awesome at everything. So what are we going to be awesome at? Let's pick two things and let's be all in. Federally, provincially, municipally, we need to develop curriculum that helps support it, funding models that help support it. Let's determine what are the one or two things we're awesome at uh, and let's effectively ignore uh, everything else. Um, but the one thing that I, I, would, I would say as it relates to my industry in particular, you hear a lot of people saying, um, we got to make Canada Silicon Valley North. Right? If we do that, somehow that's going to be a success. And what I would say to anybody that says that is, we're never going to be Silicon Valley North because there's only one Silicon Valley, and God bless them, they do what they do really well. But that doesn't mean that we can't build something awesome in Canada that isn't Silicon Valley North, but is, is world class. I mean, the one thing they are very good at doing at Sil Silicon Valley is, is, is selling themselves. Uh, they're some of the best marketers in the world. So yes. I, I, I would agree with you as somebody who lived in the United States for 10 years and has lived in cities like San Francisco and L.A. and New York, being back in Toronto. There is a high level of excitement right now, a, a real buzz around some of the startup community, and yet that, um, that ability to then take that story and, and that message to the world is, is sort of another hurdle, I would say. I couldn't agree more. The, the good news for all of us is we have a mayor and a prime minister right now that are building very strong narratives that don't mind shouting from mountaintops. Um, and, and that has not been true for a very long time in our country. 
And so I, I, I believe the future prosperity of Canada is as much a marketing exercise as it is a development exercise. We need people to know why we are great and how they can partner with us, how they could use us, how they could license our IP for them to be great too. Uh, and I think right now we just do a mediocre job. I, I think I'm gonna start getting through some of these questions just because there's some good ones here and we might as well not rush them all right to the end. Yeah, we're good? Okay. Um, I'm gonna start with this one because it's fun. What do you do all day? What, 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 what? <laughs> so, so, I, <laughs> so I have this dinner for my mom's 70th birthday. And uh, so I have a bunch of her friends over, and, and it was a great dinner. And uh, one of her friends who's similarly aged says to me, how many people do you have work at Facebook? I said, well, 14,000 globally, 100 plus in Canada. She's like, but doesn't Facebook run itself? We're like, like what, what's your job? What do you do? And I'm waiting for this smile, like, she was 100% serious. Uh, so what do I do all day? Um, I spend um, a lot of time thinking about our people um, and ensuring that they are aligned, ensuring that they are attaching to our vision and ensuring that they're being held accountable for what it is they say they're gonna do. Um, I spend a fair bit of time trying to figure out where our talent gaps exist and making sure I'm in market identifying people who would be great uh, at filling those gaps. Um, I try to spend time thinking about 2018. Like I sort of know what's gonna happen in Q4 and I have a pretty good sense of how we orient 2017. Um, but in 2018, um, I'm not as sure. And what I do know for sure, there is an 18 year old uh, teenager who's sitting in her garage right now trying to build the next Facebook. Uh, and what she's thinking about 2018 is that's the year she's gonna eat our lunch. And so if we're not thinking about her uh, with eyes and ears wide open to the people that use Facebook and the businesses we partner with that use Facebook to make sure that it's an incredible experience that encapsulates and incorporates all of the things they need, um, we could be in a little bit of trouble. Good news is I think we do a really good job of synthesizing feedback and then actioning it pretty quickly from all the constituents in the Facebook ecosystem. I think a lot about the Facebook ecosystem. So I do spend time, Facebook, you know, when Mark started Facebook, he had such an interesting decision to make. He could have made it a destination site, which at the time, 12 and a half, 13 years ago, that was what everybody was doing, which is I am gonna build a site and I'm gonna spend a lot of money for people to come to my site and everything that's social that happens on the internet should happen on Facebook. He could have done that and at the time people would have said that's probably the right decision because everybody's doing it. Or he could have done what he ended up doing, which is build a platform. And what a platform allows people to do, a platform allows us to build great technology and allow all of these other young, small, and large businesses to build on top of Facebook for free so that they can build businesses. And what Mark decided to do was build a platform. And so what I think about doing is what role do we have in the ecosystem of people building on Facebook who are making the experiences on Facebook better for all of our users? How do we make that better? How do we engage with them? How do we support them? How do we provide them with the information, the education, and the training that will just make them a whole lot better? Um, and I think in this country, um, I think we've done a pretty good job. You know, Deloitte came out in 2015 with an economic impact study on Facebook. And, and the headline was Facebook um, helps enable over $5 billion in economic activity and is responsible for more than 80,000 jobs. Now that's not happening at Facebook headquarters here. That's happening in the ecosystem and with all of the small, mid, and large-sized businesses that are using Facebook for their livelihoods. No, I mean, it, 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 it is fascinating to hear um, sort of forward expectations and trying to see where the world is. We live in a data-driven world uh, more and more every day. But at the end of the day, you can only use that data to determine what has already happened. Uh, the sort of the expectations on where we're going using data can probably give you an idea, and certainly Facebook does that when they show us pictures of, here's how people used Facebook in the past, and then here's the, the VR technology yeah. that might be the Facebook experience in five or 10 years. Yep. It's still just a pretty good guess based on data. Um, it's a, it, it used to be a pretty good guess, now it's a fantastic guess, and then my, my guess is in two years it'll be a perfect guess. So um, if you were to think about our innovation strategy over the course of the next, call it 10 years, there really are four pillars. Uh, you know, the first pillar we talked about, which is to connect the unconnected world, make sure that more than the four billion plus people who don't have connectivity get it. Mm -hmm. um, the second pillar is all around artificial intelligence. And so what artificial intelligence does at its most simple form is it takes lots of 
data sets, huge, massive amounts of data sets, uh, and predicts very effectively what it is you either want to do, what it is you want to see, or in our case, what type of stuff do you want to share. Um, and there really isn't a business today, a sophisticated business, that isn't using a form of artificial intelligence to make the experience better. And so today, again, our artificial intelligence capability, what you see in your newsfeed, for example, is driven by artificial intelligence and machine learning. Third pillar is augmented reality. Um, and so Pokemon Go, it's where the virtual world and the physical world come together. Um, we're just getting rolling there. We're trying to figure it out. Pokemon Go is a great example at scale of a way it could work. And, you know, at Facebook, what we've done is we've done things like develop technology that allows a, a, a sight-impaired person to have um, a piece of technology read a picture uh, and then in, in audio format say, this is your friend John um, sitting on the beach on a chair with his dog. Right, that's the real world and the virtual world coming together. And then the final step of the innovation agenda really is around virtual reality, which is very little, uh, very basically connected to the analog world and almost entirely takes place in the virtual world. So the ability for you in your basement to experience almost everything and anything. You want to go to a Raptors game when they're playing in Los Angeles against the Lakers, you can do that with a set of goggles. You live in rural India and you want to talk to a doctor who specializes in an illness that your child has, you can do that too from your, from your uh, house in India. Um, you want to sit in small town Canada and you want to get educated at INSEAD in Europe, you can do that using virtual reality. And by the way, the experience itself is totally immersive. So you feel like you're sitting in a class at INSEAD in Europe. Good question here about um, compliance and, and, and regulated businesses who may want to use Facebook or social media in a bigger way, yeah. but there are things that might stand in the way. Um, I would think there's sort of a, a similar strain with this question for businesses that are looking to grow their sort of presence on Facebook, but maybe cautious on the pitfalls of social media, generally speaking, that one post that was the wrong one. But how do you, how do you address those kind of issues, people who just feel like they can't be using Facebook because the lawyers don't want them to? Yeah, and, and, and I have great sort of sympathy for highly regulated businesses. Um, because the handcuffs are on and what you can do is, is narrow. But having said that, doesn't mean that you can't use Facebook. And so there are a couple of principles, I think, that are important for folks in regulated businesses who understand the power but wonder, like, is it for me? The first is, um, if you are in a service business, service businesses are based on humans. Right? I trust you and I like you and therefore I'm going to subscribe to or buy your service. And so it is you that I'm attaching to, you the salesperson I'm attaching to, as much as the service itself. And so what we talk a lot about is just the, being yourself on Facebook, right? Humanly, who are you? What do you stand for? What nonprofits do you support? What issues are important to you? Like, what do you do in your spare time? The more you can humanize who you are, the more people will connect with you, and ultimately the better your business will be. And the regulators can't do anything about that. And so if you are an investment advisor, the best thing you can do is build a persona, a genuine and authentic persona on Facebook and Instagram so that clients and potential clients will see you as a human, understand they like and trust you, and be more inclined to give you their business. Second thing is, the, 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 and this just isn't on Facebook and Instagram, but this is everywhere, the internet allows you to test and learn. And so you don't have to spend huge amounts of time or huge amounts of money doing anything. You get immediate feedback by virtue of the data around was this good, bad, or indifferent? And so rather than jumping in with both feet, if you are somewhat hesitant or curious or not sure where to start, dip a toe in the water. And let me tell you, you will get great feedback in real time, and that will totally determine and govern what it is you do next. Question here about um, prioritizing. You, you gave us sort of the, the overall marching orders that Facebook has, but that could be overwhelming to some people just in terms of what should I be doing today, yep. over the next you know, week, closing a sales deal or what have you. So when it comes to priorities and um, pushing for innovation, but helping people just literally get the job done that they need to get job, yeah. any advice on that? Yes. Um, so we have a credo um, at Facebook that goes something like this, which is if you're not ruthlessly prioritizing, um, you're not doing your job. So in a world where literally you could be doing 100 different things today, and all of them in one way or another are important, um, 
you need to stack rank them in order of what will have the most impact on our mission. And that's what we do. We ruthlessly prioritize. We have a whole process that talks about non-goals. Because you can go to an offsite with your executive team, and you could focus on all of your goals, and they could be lengthy. An equally effective exercise is what are we going to do that's important? What are we not going to do that's important that we just realized doesn't make the top five? And let's give people explicit permission to say no to doing it. So when your boss comes to you, your manager comes to you and says, I'd love you to spend some time on that. You have every right in an empowered environment to say, that's a total non-goal. Hmm. Didn't hit my top five. It's not going to have as much impact. And I'm just not doing it. And by the way, in, in cultures like this, that type of dialogue is encouraged, not frowned upon. Just a final question here. Great questions, by the way, everybody. On uh, You made that reference to the 18-year-old in 2018 who's, who's looking to crush Facebook and you're thinking about what she might be working on. But on, on the issue of collaborating yeah. with the startup community, I mean, let's face it, you're here with a whole host of startups in this environment here in Toronto. And, um, and we didn't talk even a lot about Instagram yep. today, but obviously the decision to acquire Instagram was a, an, a, an incredibly crucial one for uh, the company. What should we think about with respect to Facebook and Facebook in Canada and how it is collaborating with that next generation of entrepreneurs, or if it is at all? Yeah, no, uh, we, we are a lot. It goes back to my comment about platforms and ecosystems. Yeah. I think one of the perspectives to use when you think about what it is we do, uh, why we do it, and who we do it with um, is as follows. And this is, um, I think as a parent, uh, you know, somebody in, involved in the community, this is the reality of our lives. If you think about the evolution of content creation and consumption over the last 15 years, unbelievable. 15 years ago, um, we really focused on text-based communication. So when Facebook started, it was all text. It was all people writing, I am at the Leafs game, they are winning, I'm having a great time with my son, post. And then 10 years ago, it wasn't uncommon to be on a platform like Facebook and see photos that were posted. So it was, I'm at the Leafs game with my son, look at him wearing his fill-in-the-blank jersey. And then five years ago, we saw this massive shift to mobile. And with mobile came the ability for everybody to be a content creator and everybody to start creating content using video. And so this was standard video, and this was the ice, bu ice bucket challenge, right. right? This was watching my child on her bike for the first time and sharing it on Facebook on video from my, from my mobile device. Um, and that changed everything. And then today, text is sort of important, pictures are sort of, sort of, still sort of important, video, critically important, and now you see things like 360 degree video, and Facebook Live, which is a form of live stream video that didn't really exist a year ago, and now every day in Canada, there are 12 years worth of live video consumed by Canadians on Facebook each and every day. Mm. And so that's the next evolution of video. So when we think about how do we interact with our ecosystem, how do we interact with um, the businesses that are trying to become big businesses uh, on Facebook, we talk about things like that. What do consumers want to hear? How do they want to hear it? Right message, right person, right device at the right time. And a lot of that discussion comes around what form of content do you want to share and why? And we're a storytelling platform, right? That is what we do best. We allow people in businesses, nonprofits, and governments to tell their stories in an unfettered, very efficient, 24-7 real-time way. And so for people on Facebook, especially if you're just thinking about how does my business want to use Facebook, think about what is the story that I want to tell and what is the best way to tell it. And if you give a lot of thought to that, you will inevitably be very successful on Facebook and Instagram. Well, it's been great to get your perspective, and oh, d take a couple. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm sure your mom's friends <laughs> finally have a better idea of what you do every day. Sort of. Watch this. Sort, sort of. of. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I would ask sort of a, a, a question about the, um, uh, the, the, the kinds of ways that, um, say, maybe even anecdotally, the kinds of ways that a, a nonprofit, some of whom are represented here, versus a small business, versus a large business are using Facebook today in yeah. Canada? Um, so I think the, the, the question why they are using it is, is a great question to, to answer before the what. And we've talked a little bit uh, about why, but, but let me paint another scenario for you that is the reality of all of our lives, no matter what we do, and no matter how we do it. If you 
were to imagine 100 years ago, how many messages were being fired at you every day? Radio, 100 years ago would be radio. Might be some outdoor stuff. You might read something in a quasi-newspaper. Um, it was about 150 every day. Today, it's about 10,000. So if you think about just a really simple curve on the y-axis are the number of messages that are trying to get to you each and every day. The curve is like this. And by the way, it won't flatten anytime soon. It's only going to get steeper. We're going to go from 10,000 to 15,000 to 50,000 to 100,000. But here's the reality of our brains. Our brains over that same period of time have not changed one iota. So our ability to deal with that amount of information and all of those messages and synthesize it and try to figure out what the heck is relevant to me and why should I care, it is really, really tough. And so the question is, how do you reconcile that ever-increasing gap, no matter what part of your life you're thinking about? Um, and, and the answer is, I need to be able to target people that care about what it is I'm saying in a very timely, in a very personalized, in a very customized way. And so that's sort of what we do, right? We allow people to tell stories and target the people in Canada and beyond that they think will be most interested in that story. And that's the way you fight through the noise, right? Our news feed is the way that I only see, for the most part, things that are most relevant to me. And so if I'm a nonprofit, um, Facebook's free to use, right? Free to start a page. And now I have a voice that can be amplified, not to a bunch of people that have no interest in what it is I'm saying, um, but to people that have expressed a desire to help out in the world of dementia or somebody who has self-identified that they have had cancer, or somebody who is fundraising for diabetes, those messages will land with people like that more efficiently and effectively by virtue of that targeting capability. And that's really what we want. Right? We want our lives to be filled with messages and people that are most meaningful to us. It doesn't matter who you are, nonprofit, mom, best friend, somebody running for political office, CEO of a business. And I think that is why Nonprofits and small businesses have been so magnetic to Facebook because it allows them to do efficiently what they never, ever could have done. Said another way, it democratizes our world in ways that never could have happened before Facebook. In, in, in a world that sometimes does, though, feel overwhelming as open and connected, despite yeah. all the positive benefits that come from it, will yeah. we be taking a moment offline from time to time going forward? Um, you know, I think we will. I, I think we will. I think that there is a, a saturation point at which all of us say, enough already, right? Like, I just can't see another post, get another text, see another emoji, watch another video. Um, and, and that's OK. I think everybody has a different level of tolerance. Um, I think sometimes it's just good for the human spirit to unplug and go for a walk or a hike, um, play golf, play Like, just don't be connected. Sit with your kids, be in the moment. And for the people that do that really well, by the way, their experience um, on Facebook and Instagram is heightened even more. So if you have something to compare it to, the quiet zen-like time versus I'm scrolling through my newsfeed and loving the visual language of Instagram, they love it even more. Right? Their brain isn't consistently firing. Their brain just starts to fire again. Um, and so I know I, I love unplugging. And if I don't unplug, in times I don't unplug, I'm just not as good. That's great. Jordan, thank you so much. Pleasure. Yeah, thank great. you. And thanks for coming. Nice to, you, nice to host. Uh, my name's Andrew Graham, and I'm on the board of the Canadian Club. Um, and it's my, uh, my honor to uh, thank our, our speaker and our interviewer. Um, I'm also the CEO of a company called Borowell, which uh, Jordan was kind enough to mention. And we're a very uh, happy and proud customer of uh, Facebook. Um, the, some of the you know, modest success that we've enjoyed, I think uh, you know, a great deal it ha it really has to do uh, to Facebook. It's really given us a way to you know, get our message out to many more people uh, much more quickly in a much more targeted way than would have been possible. So I think Jordan's remarks about that and the power of Facebook for small and emerging businesses certainly rang very true to me. Um, you know, I, I think all of us today, regardless of what sector we're in, uh, took a lot from the discussion between uh, John and Jordan. I can tell you that in the startup world, in the tech world in Canada, Jordan really is an icon. He's viewed as a, as a real leader and also a real supporter of other businesses. 
Um, he, you know, through different uh, vehicles that he's part of, he's an investor in, in other businesses, and I know an advisor in many businesses. So he, uh, we, we really have had the benefit not only of a of a leader of Facebook, but really a leader in Canada's tech community today, and I, I'm sure that came across to all of you. Um, so I, I, you know, really uh, thanks again, uh, Jordan, for your time, and John for all the, the the great questions and the and the moderation. Really, a very very rich conversation, and such a nice place to be, a nice change um, to uh, to have it. You know, as I mentioned, we're a, a, a customer of Facebook. I like to think that we were the informal sponsors of breakfast, given what we've spent on, on Facebook ads. So I hope you all enjoyed it. I hope you all enjoy it and, and uh, grab some on the way out. So thanks again to, our, 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 uh, to Jordan and John. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, I'll be sending you the check for the sponsorship. Uh. <laughs> I, uh, I also want to reinforce uh, my appreciation to Jordan and John for kickstarting our morning this morning. You've, uh, you've given us lots to think about, so thank you. Uh, to learn more about the club, please visit our website at canadianclub.org. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at another of our events in the near future. Have a wonderful rest of your day.